so words matter. Words change the tone, the frame, and behavior. Words can change practice. The adage of sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me isn't really true because words can hurt, but they can also heal. Welcome to the Words Matter series, where we engage in open and authentic discussions about the impact of common terminology used in child serving systems with those that are directly affected. Our goal is to illuminate how terms we use can influence perception, approach, and practice, as well as explore alternative language as a means of intentionally shifting how we view and interact with youth and with families and with each other. Today, we'll be exploring the use of the term equity and how that's implemented. But before we begin, I want everyone who's here to take a moment to consider a question. What comes to mind when you think of equity? Using the link in the chat box, Joanne's going to drop it in there. Um, please respond to the Minty poll with the thoughts and the perceptions that come to mind when you hear equity. What does that mean to you? And as people start to put their response in, you're going to see it show up as a word cloud. Um, if you're familiar with word clouds, um, the words that show up in the largest font are the ones that the most people are putting in as their response. So when you think of equity, equality, fairness, justice, same opportunities. Let's see. Resources, opportunity, a seat at the table, meeting needs, fairness and access are showing up the biggest right now. These are really great answers. Um, absolutely needed, just, equal. We still have fairness showing up, but now justice is a larger font. So more people are putting in justice than access right now. Anti-disparity, misunderstood. That's interesting. For anybody who's just joined, there's a link in the chat box to be able to go to the Minty poll. And what comes to mind when you think of equity? Access, fairness, and justice and equal opportunity seem to be our biggest ones right now. Okay. I think we've got a good, um, a good number of responses now. Thanks, Joanne. And thank you everyone who, who responded to that. Um, so we are going to talk about the term equity and how it impacts youth and families. Um, we've got a great panel of, of discussants today and I'm excited to introduce you to them. Um, we have McKenna Schilling, who is a young adult from North Virginia, who is a member of the LGBTQ plus community and a youth peer support provider. We have Yusuf Presley, who is a young adult from Kansas, who's had experiences in both the foster care and the juvenile justice systems. We have Jennifer Novo, also known as Jen to me, who is from my home state of Tennessee. Um, she is a parent, um, as well as the executive director of Futuro in Tennessee, um, who works with college age Latino youth. And Adamina Tankersley, who is a parent, and a colleague of mine as well, and the board president of Philly, Philadelphia Family Voices in Pennsylvania. So I wanna, I wanna thank all of you for being here um, and for being willing to share your experiences and your perspectives and your ideas. Um, we're gonna get started. Equity. Um, equity is a term that's very present right now. It's very relevant in mental health, but really everywhere. Um, it's, it's a lot of conversations going on with this. Equity and mental health intersect. People often experience both mental health issues and addictions and additional inequities, such as poverty, racialization, homophobia, simultaneously. From a lack of affordable therapy to cultural stigmas to unequal access to mental health education, 
the disparities are really apparent to all of us. The goal that this access should be equal is known as mental health equity, and it specifically focuses on the ability or the inability to access quality and appropriate healthcare services. How this is implemented truly varies by provider, by organization, and by system, and it can be very minimal to a very involved process and very intentional process. Parents or youth and young adults, however, may define equity differently than providers or systems based on their lived experiences in services and those child serving systems. Um, so, and, and then I'm gonna start with uh, McKenna and, and Yusuf. Um, from a young adult perspective, from your own lived experiences in the communities in which you live and work and have had experiences, what does equity mean to you? You can go ahead and go, McKenna. Well, thank you. You are a gentleman and a scholar. Uh, so uh, <laughs> just to be transparent, uh, my pronouns are she, her. I'm not as tech savvy. I couldn't figure out how to make Zoom show it. So I apologize. <laughs> and I do identify as a lesbian or a la gay lady if I'm feeling jazzy. Um, so for me personally, especially as a youth in the system, the, the primary um, focus in terms of equity would be safety first and foremost. Um, you know, I'll be transparent. I'm 33 years old now. I came up as a teenager in a time when we weren't really having as many conversations around um, the LGBTQ plus community. And I wasn't always in a place or in a position where I could safely disclose to the adults in my life, even as a minor, that I was a member of that community. And so uh, it, recognizing that it, it may not always be safe to share that information. Yes, that even if that person is a minor, you know, I do, especially now working with youth, you know, work with parents too and parents, well, I have a right to know, but you know, you also have to understand that, that there's a very real um, concern there, but also too, beyond just safety, um, making space for us so that we don't have to make space for ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, when I have to cross off on a form that I don't have a husband, but I in fact have a wife and write it in and I will do it at the time, um, <laughs> you know, that, that means that you, you've not made space for me, for who I am as a person mm -hmm. inherently. And that's very frustrating. And, you know, is it, is it somebody running up and punching me in the face? No, but it, it's kind of a constant reminder of you don't really belong. Mm -hmm. um, so also making sure that, that we are informed of all possibilities and how we present these options, even if it's mm -hmm. just something simple like intake paperwork. Yeah. So equity for you looks like it's a safe space where I have a space. I'm acknowledged. Um, who I am is acknowledged. Um, and and, and you, you see me. Absolutely. And, and informed mm -hmm. providers too. If we're adding yes. to the wish list, yes. um, I don't want to have to educate my therapist on what it means to be LGBTQ plus. I feel like, you know, that, that mm -hmm. should be, we should be working from that as baseline and then we'll go from there. <laughs> yes. So those, yes. those kinds of things too. Mm -hmm. People are knowledgeable um, and they can meet you where you are. Yes. Yusuf, what does equity mean to you? Yes. So, so for me, Equity means a lot because at a young age, equity is, was actually taken from me. Um, growing up in foster care, um, going home to home, um, not being able to play sports, make friends, and be able to control my own destiny. So for me, equity is, is when you give a kid equity, you give that kid the ability to control, the, control their own destiny. And mm -hmm. that was stripped from me at a young age. And mm -hmm. so as I, as I get into my adulthood, I'm still learning, I'm still learning how to control and, and I'm gaining my equity as, as we speak. This is, this, this is, this is equity for me right here. Yeah. So, you know, going, going through foster care, it sounds like you didn't get the same opportunities as those Absolutely. that were not in foster care that might be in a permanent placement. Yes. And so that, that's so, not equitable. Yeah. Yes. Was, was taken for me and it was I wasn't able to learn how other kids were able to learn I wasn't mm -hmm. able to interact how other kids were able to interact so you know per se opportunity was 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 taken altogether. yeah yeah thank you for sharing that um no Adamina 
from, from a parent perspective, what does equity mean to you? Absolutely. For me, from a parent's perspective, equity means to me is allowing my son, who uh, definitely has mental and behavioral health concerns, allowing him to be on the sports team, not to judge that he's incapable of being on that team just because of his diagnoses, or to make room for him in that space and not to exclude him because of his diagnoses, or saying, oh, you know, we're not equipped to support a child like yours. Well, how do you know? You haven't even given him the opportunity to participate. You've automatically seen his diagnosis and assumed he's incapable. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you haven't even given him the opportunity to enjoy what the other kids enjoy. My son has never, ever been on a sports team, ever. But he has always desired to be, but they've never allowed him to because as soon as they read his diagnosis, it's like, oh, sorry, we can't help you. So mm -hmm. that's like heart wrenching for a parent to always know that this is a desire your child has to have that type of socialization and to enjoy what the average kid wants to enjoy. Mm -hmm. But you already know before you even get there, they're going to say no. You mm -hmm. don't stop trying, but they're going to say no. And you just have so to you're discriminated that. against. Absolutely. You have but a, they you don't have call a it discrimination. They, no. they don't call it discrimination. They tie it up in a nice bow with, oh, we're not able to support him. You know, we're not able to, to provide the support and, and his needs, mm -hmm. but you're just using different words other than discrimination, but you are discriminating against him mm -hmm. and others like him. Yeah, so true. Thank you, Adamina. Jen, how would you define equity in both your personal as, as a parent um, and, and your own personal experiences and as a professional? So my line of work uh, revolves entirely on equity in education. Uh, as a parent of a child with ADHD and depression and anxiety disorder, as well as an individual who has suffered with the same ADHD, depression, and anxiety as well, there's so many levels that come with those kinds of um, experiences. Mm -hmm. And so with equity, it's about understanding systems and how the systems impact an individual. Each individual has their own needs, their own experiences, and equity is about allowing people to bring their authentic selves to whatever space they bring. But in order for you to create a system that creates fairness and, and justice and really freedom to, to be fair, you have to get to know the individual you have to understand their experiences, really listen to the challenges that they're experiencing and collectively work together to come up with resources and solutions to support that individual so that th those differences or that diversity that they bring to the table can really shine and make it so that they have an opportunity to thrive and mm -hmm. not just survive. Yes, that diversity is a strength. It's not, it's not a deficit. It's yes. not something that they need supports for, you know, I mean, it's, it's who they are. So equity is um, meeting people where they are and recognizing that you individualize um, how you support them, serve them. Um, it, it's about that individualization. Thank you. Um, so moving to our second question. Uh, research has shown that equity issues in mental health have a significant and often negative impact on people, communities, and systems. The issues are wide ranging, they're complex, and they touch on diverse populations. We know that there are better outcomes in services when youth and families receive what they need, when they need it, and how they need it in the way that they need it. It's individualized. Providers are encouraged to individualize service delivery and to take concrete steps to eliminate all the disparities that we know exist. It's fair to say that although some may strive to implement this, equity remains an issue and a goal um, in, at the organizational level, uh, the individual service provision level, at the system level. Youth and families may feel or be affected differently when this term is used, but not fully implemented in their situation or their experience. Um, so I ask um, all of you, and 
any any of you could could start initially. What impacts have you seen or experienced based on how equity is or is not implemented? I'd love to kick this one off, Millie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, as a first generation college student, um, and I, I really experienced many challenges when I first entered co college and the university. And um, my parents didn't understand what what were all of the demands required of a college student and really um, caused a lot of friction at home when I would have to come home late um, from, from late study sessions. And so um, I sought out help at the campus um, counseling center. And when I shared with my counselor how my family didn't really approve of me staying out late because of my culture, my counselor's first reaction was, don't they understand that you're 18 already? And I, I just laughed because in my culture, you don't leave your home uh, unless you're married off. In my culture, you respect your, your parents' decisions to a level of, you know, you, you're, it's a very hierarchical system. And, and mm -hmm. that experience stays with me so much because I had to spend multiple sessions with my counselor explaining how my culture works and why this one size fits all of I'm an adult didn't apply to me. And mm -hmm. it was very challenging for me if it weren't for my counselors or my, excuse me, if it weren't for my professors who were also Latinos, um, if, if it weren't, they weren't there to support me, there is no way I would have graduated. And I decided to seek out a career in higher education administration after uh, I realized that I could be that person of support for so many other students who also had that same experience mm -hmm. as well. And so in my line of work, uh, I've worked with a thousand of students, many on a very close basis. I've gotten an opportunity to know them and understand what are the challenges that they're facing. And when students or kids really learn to build their identity, um, it's very evident to me, the ones who have had the mental health support or have had support at home because they are the ones who really thrive and maybe they mm -hmm. have some hiccups along the way, but mm -hmm. they don't have entire crises that, that they're working through where they don't have a support system. They don't have individuals who understand their, their needs. And many times they they fall through the cracks and don't end up graduating. And so I focused a lot of my career on student success and retention and really understanding what are the issues, what are the circumstances that would cause a student to have attrition or not graduate, and what are um, the aspects of a student experience that will allow them to thrive and graduate and self-actualize. And one of the key factors was feeling like they have a community to rely on and feeling like they could be their authentic selves and mm -hmm. have a space where they can just have a support system and really run with it. Mm -hmm. yeah, you, you said something that, that really resonates. Those that had the opportunities and the access for supports were the ones that thr that are thriving, that would thrive. Um, and those that didn't were the ones that really, really, really struggled. Um, yes. And so, yes. you know, equity is fairness and having access to those opportunities. And it, it makes a huge impact on the outcome, for sure. Absolutely. And when when you look at students who have a great amount of challenge, they must be met with equal amount of support. Mm -hmm. So yes. some of these students really and individuals really need a higher level of support. And that's what equity is about. It's mm -hmm. about understanding the needs of the individual and meeting them where they're at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've all, I say all the time, fairness doesn't mean that everybody gets the same thing. It means you get what you need. Um, it, you, you get what it is that you individually need. Yeah. Um, others, what, what impacts of uh, when you've seen equitable practices put in place or when they're not there, what impacts have you seen? Um, um, I, 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 oh, go ahead, McKenna. I don't mean to please go ahead. <laughs> um, for me, a, a lot of times it shows up um, for my son and I when I'm taking him to, um, you know, to like a therapy session or if I'm um, 
taking him to, cause see for my son, he sees his psychiatrist every week, right? And for years, my son will not speak with his psych psychiatrist by himself. That's just not something he's comfortable with. That's just not something he wants to do. He trusts his psychiatrist, but he's like, mom, I need you to sit next to me. And I had a therapist who um, does not work with the psychiatrist, but she's like, well, why don't you ever let him go talk by, your, by himself? I said, well, that's not what he chooses to do. She's like, well, don't you encourage it? I said, well, why am I encouraging him to do something that he's choosing not to do? If he's saying, I want my mother here, why am I encouraging him not to? She's like, well, don't you want to see if he can do it? I said, I don't think that that's the point. I think the point is if he feels as though I can be open, I can be honest, and I can talk with the psychiatrist, but I want my mother here, then why not? She's like, well, I don't think that's letting him be um, independent. I said, but that's your opinion of what independence is. I said, because for us, it takes a lot for my son to share the things that he's sharing. Mm -hmm. So you're having a different an opinion of what independence is. Me, I'm ecstatic that he's talking to this person at mm -hmm. all, you know, because he don't talk to you like that, does he? She's like, no, he doesn't really share with me. I said, because you keep asking me to sit in the hallway. <laughs> so it's like, you know, you're assuming I'm making my son do something because mm -hmm. he has these diagnoses and he's autistic. But nine times out of 10, my son is really calling the shots and I'm meeting him where he's at. You know, when mm -hmm. it comes to things like, oh, you know, he doesn't really cook. Well, how am I supposed to let him starve? Or am I supposed to say, okay, he has hit a brick road. You know, he's hit the brick wall. This is the point that he's at. Am I supposed to keep pushing him to do it? Or when does it come a time as mom that I'm accepting this is what he knows, this is where he's at? It's not giving up on him. It's accepting where he's at. Mm -hmm. So am I supposed to let society tell me when to accept him? Or am I supposed to read his cues of meeting him where he's at and meeting the needs that he's showing to me? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to choose what he's showing to me every time and not what society is expecting. Mm -hmm. to and me, you're that's informing me others. Yes, you're exactly. In, exactly. You're informing others of that. Yes. And so in and a way he is like controlling your family mm -hmm. because your family, I mean, with me, um, uh, I'm African-American and Hispanic and in, in both cultures, it's like, let him do his own thing. He's at this age. And I'm like, okay, but he's not the same. He's just very different. You know, we have our own little, you know, dance that we do. We have our own thing that we get through the day. And this is what works for us. And this is how he thrives. And a lot of times it's like, oh, you're babying him. You're not allowing him to grow up. But I have learned over time that I have to, you know, shut that out because they don't really understand where he's at. They mm -hmm. have an understanding of a family and a cultural view and not of these are his needs. And if I don't meet his needs, then he's going to be lacking. Mm -hmm. and, and is that really fair and equitable for him? Mm -hmm. So we go back to that individualization and, and, and as a parent, hearing what parents are saying that I know my kid and I, I know this is what works and this is what is, doesn't work and, and meeting the parent to where they are. Thank you, yeah. Amina. McKenna. Um, I'm a huge, huge proponent of cultural competency and I absolutely love the points that every one of my co-panelists have made, mm -hmm. um, especially, you know, like Adamina, especially just recently touched on listening if somebody's telling you this is what I need, listen. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't think they're right, just listen. Stop. Ask questions. Listen. Here, like the number of times that I have heard in my life, either as personally or professionally, oh well, you know that's that's your parent. They love you. They wouldn't do you know they wouldn't do that. Or oh, that's that kid's parent. They love them. They wouldn't you do that to them. And then we see things like incredibly high rates of youth homelessness in the LGBTQ plus community, somewhere it's happening. Please listen when we tell you this is a real problem we are coming up against. We may not always have the answers or we may not have perfect answers, but when we do reach out and we do say, hey, this is a problem, that's usually our attempt to say, we're asking you to help us fix it. You know, when, when I, and, and, you know, Adamina, just to be completely transparent, I'm also on the spectrum. I didn't find out until I was an adult. And I, I so relate. And my brother, my youngest brother is also on the spectrum. And the number of times that people have said, oh, but, but he needs to do X, Y, Z. No, he needs to do what he needs to do. And you need to listen to us. Because I promise you, we have spent the time and the energy. And, you know, and for me and for my family and for my wife, I promise we've had the conversations. 
I promise we've done the research. I promise we've given it the thought. We don't say these things willy nilly. And the number of times I've had somebody immediately default to that can't be true. Oh, that couldn't have, somebody couldn't have done that, you know, or even, I, I will never forget telling my father that my wife, who was a bridesmaid in her best friend's wedding, we were relegated to like the dead last table. And if you know anything about weddings, that's an insult. And the bride's parents made a point to, to, to exclude my wife and I. And when I told my dad that, his immediate response was, oh, that can't have been the case. And I was like, dad, you don't know this man from Adam. Why is it your instant response to tell me I'm wrong and I'm lying? Mm-hmm. Like, please believe us when we trust you with sharing our experiences. That is equity. Understanding that maybe you don't know it personally, understanding that maybe you've not been there, but believing us at our word is huge. And that's, mm-hmm. I think, the first step to equity. Mm-hmm. Trusting your experience and, and working within that is, is huge. And, and just being that inclusion piece that you mentioned, you know, it, equity means having access to all those opportunities and being included as part of the mainstream, the right, you know, we're just living our lives. We're just living our lives, you know, so that thank, thank you for sharing that. You said, do you have anything you'd like to add about the impact um, when yeah, there are sure. e- equitable practices in place and when they're not? Yeah, for sure. So uh, the panelists, they, they, they nailed it pretty much all across the board. So like, I thank, I thank them for that. Um, but something that McKenna said was that um, we don't always get it right. And I feel like that that's very true because we, we won't, all, we're, not, we're not perfect. And um, I think Jennifer has said that, you know, the system is not a one size fits all thing. And it's not because I know from personal experiences that you have to, you have to individualize certain things. Like with my mm-hmm. learning, I had to, I had to have a special individualized learning to, to learn, you know, so it's just, it's a lot of different things that, that go into things. And, and we've, we failed over and over again. And, and part of the reason why is because we have that one, one size fits all approach. And that's just not true. And, that's one of the things that we're going to have to change as a community going forward. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, because that does exclude people when you try to fit everybody into the same, you know, it's, it's the square peg in the round hole. You know, why do we have the hole to begin with? So it, it just, everybody comes in different shapes. Um, and I noticed that Jen pointed out um, you know, majority versus minority culture. At part of equity comes from recognizing that some cultures have it easier than other cultures, that we have practices, policies, and systems in place that continue that. That, that we have disparities um, where there are differences made. Um, so I know, Jen, you want to um, speak to that. And then, Adamita, um, you're, ne- you're right after that. Yes, so uh, the premise behind majority versus minority culture is not about race or about a particular demographic um, of society. It's more of understanding when you are in a particular environment, uh, you will either fall within a majority or a minority within the group. So if you are at an LGBT chamber of commerce event and you are an ally, you know, it's it's very different from you being out in a particular work environment where it might be uh, anti-LGBT, right? And so Mm -hmm. it really is about understanding, are you within a, a majority? Do you fall within a majority or do you fall within a minority? And so there's so many aspects to that. I mean, most of us, I love to use this example from Culture Shift Team, where they use uh, mo- most of us are right-handed versus being left-handed, right? And mm-hmm. if you go to a left-handed convention, <laughs> you're gonna see that maybe <laughs> the door handles are on the other side, or maybe the scissors are all different, uh, or you know, th- there's just so many examples, right? I grew mm-hmm. up in Miami, majority culture Hispanic, majority culture Latina, right? Um, and I moved to Tennessee, where suddenly I was within the minority culture, and I share all of this to really point out that when you fall within a majority, 
of a group, it is your responsibility to listen to the minority culture and understand how you can be more inclusive. And McKenna, that example that you gave was just a, another one where we really need to understand when we occupy a space, what are we intentionally doing to include others? Mm -hmm. Wow, powerful, Jen, very powerful. And it is multi-layered, multi-layered. Adamina. Yeah, for me, I it took my son to really teach me the whole accepting where he's at because I was trying to get him to learn something. I kept trying and kept trying and kept trying. And he was like, mom, you know, it really hurts my feelings that you don't believe that I can't do this. And you keep trying to make me do it. And I can't. And I'm like, what? I was like, well, I just wanted to encourage you. I'm, I'm just trying. He's like, but mom, you're not encouraging me. My feelings are hurt. That's discouraging me. And oh, it wow. clicked for me. Okay, you have to pay more attention. Is it because he can't do it? Is it because you're not encouraging him? Or is it because you want him to do it? Mm -hmm. And you, you really have to take that time when you're working with people that have many differences. Like, am I really listening to him? You know, I'm sorry, that's my niece in the background. Like, am I really <laughs> listening to him? Do, do I want it to be so? Or, or am I accepting that, okay, he can't do it. How are we going to make it possible for this to get done? Do I need to step in and take some of the steps? You know, do we, we need to work together for some of these steps? Or do I need to change it and erase some of the steps so that he's capable? Yeah. And, and it really took me that to really realize, okay, accept him where he's at. And then people were like, well, are you giving up on him? And I'm like, no. I'm removing his feelings of inadequacy. I'm mm -hmm. removing him feeling like I can't. And to me, I think he's grown ever since we got to that understanding. And for mm -hmm. years, that's where I've been perceiving him at. You know, talk to me, tell mom what's going on. Like, tell me, tell me where you're comfortable with this and we'll go from there. Now, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that later on he may improve in that area. So if he's improving, great, we're going to move the bar, you know, because mm -hmm. I know you're capable of that. But really to truly accept him where he's at helps him to feel more encouraged it gives him that feeling of independence it gives him that feeling of satisfaction instead of that feeling of failure and disappointment and, and mm -hmm. that look on my face mm -hmm. yeah treat him as a person who can as a person rather than a person who can't or who is outside of the can <laughs> um so if you would all of you kind of think about in your personal experiences um what what was something that happened that that was equitable how you know what what was it that that someone did said a policy or a practice or something um and when that happened how did it affect you i'm going a little off script here Yeah, I'm definitely, you made me definitely start thinking now. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I want, I want everybody out here, you know, who's listening to this to have an example of when we do practice equity, when we do practice justice and fairness, and we individualize things, um, you know, what can it look like? I mean, I love that, that McKenna said, I don't want to have to mark out husband and put wife. It should, you know, spouse, that works, doesn't it? Significant other. Um, you know, I love that now my my 15-year-old's pediatrician has, um, you know, male, female, um, uh, you know, other, or I can't remember what's listed there, but finally there's a box for my kid to check, you know, and, and it's like, okay, you heard me, you heard me you know, their preferred name, their name, it's not preferred, their name is now what their providers call them instead of what's written on the birth certificate. You know, that is creating space for my kid where they do feel safe and they do feel like they're heard. So, I mean, that's something that immediately comes to mind for me, fairness. Um, so can you think of, of something that, that happened with you um, that created that? What did somebody do? People need examples of how this can happen. 
Um, this is a really silly, like light one, but um, very recently I had to book travel. I'm gonna go hang with my mom for a bit over the holidays. And um, the, the travel agent re realized that I had just gotten married in the last three years. She was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I wanna just double check. Is your last name the same? Did you change it? Did you hyphenate? She didn't just assume. She was like, oh, what's the deal? I was like, oh, my wife took my name. She's like, great, I'll make a note. And so now when she books for my wife, then, but then she's also like, oh, and your sister, who's marrying a man in May, do you know if she's going to change her name or not? Because I can make a note to your, your too. And I was like, wow, that was like completely equitable in, I don't have to go to the trouble of being like, hey, fix my last name, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's it's little, it's silly, but it's a thoughtful thing. Yeah, well, it's it's not making an assumption, which you can do across little things and really big things that can make an impact. So, last month, um, I went I went to the polls and I went to went to cast my vote, and right after, like direct right after I cast my vote, you know. I, I think we lost you, Yusuf. We can't hear you. It's like your microphone cut out. I know there were some connectivity issues. You okay, am I back there, now? You're back. Okay. Yes, mm -hmm. I was. I was just saying. Um, last month when I went to cast my vote um, elections. Whenever, after, right, directly after I cast a vote, like I felt a sense of freedom. I, I felt a sense of power. I felt a sense of relief. And and that, and in, and when I think about equity, I think I think of stuff like that. I think because mm -hmm. I think that's fair. You get to cast your vote, and you have the freedom to cast your vote. So I think mm -hmm. I think of equity like that. Yeah, having a voice that that you have input. You know, you you can can say this, this is what I want. Um, that, that definitely fits right in with this. Jen or Adamina, do you have examples of, yes. of when you've seen it in practice? Yes. So um, a teacher identified that my son um, should seek out an evaluation for ADHD. I think as practitioners, as parents, it's important that we understand the what being neurotypical looks like maybe the the bell curve of understanding well what's the average for many of us we are either first time parents or new in a space and we may not realize that things are not the typical and so when there is a department like special education services in the public school system that's designated specifically to address the needs of a child, it's very comforting for me to know, wow, the school district has taken the time to establish policies and procedures to help support us. And that there is there's a system and a way that we are looking to address the needs. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of what as individuals you can do regardless of what your background is, I think it's very important that you intentionally hire diverse people from diverse backgrounds so that they can share with you what's the missing piece. Because when you come with that majority culture mindset, you don't realize that the doors are favored towards right-handed people, right? Mm -hmm. You don't realize that the scissors are not uh, meant to be for left-handed people, right? And so it's about understanding that there are other experiences and that you're creating a space to intentionally hire people with those backgrounds, with those experience who have a voice, who can raise their hand and say, this is a need that the community has and what are we doing to address those needs? And mm -hmm. whether you work in healthcare, whether you're in um, a school system, whether you're a corporate entity, um, you know, creating a space for ERGs, which are employee resource groups, where a group can come together, feel safe, share their experiences, and then report back to their company and organization to say, this is what's what the needs are. And as a superior, go back and say, 
okay, I hear you, I see you, let's work together to come up with a solution. And being humble enough to say, maybe we were doing it wrong, or maybe we need to open our minds to change. Mm -hmm. And that's hard. It's very hard. This, this kind of work is, is very difficult because people are set in their ways. And the biggest issue that we have in this line of work is people saying, but we've always done it this way. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, if we've always done something the same way, we wouldn't have, we'd still all be driving Model Ts and we wouldn't have airplanes. And, um, you know, I mean, if, if you always do something the same way, you don't ever progress. So that's, uh, I, I think, I think it's, that definitely is something that that's present all the time and uh, a myth we need to bust. A myth we Whenever need somebody to. tells me that I say, well, we used to always use leeches to treat things. Would you like me to get you some leeches and mm -hmm. <laughs> resolve that? Um, but yeah. I, I, I think that's such an important point of uh, making sure that we are doing the work on the front end of mm -hmm making sure we are providing like that education and making sure that we are having a representative group if, of people when, you know, if we're, have, if we have a workspace that involves multiple different perspectives, then we can all benefit. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that just making sure that we aren't putting the, again, I'm going to come back to not putting the onus on the minority group to do the educating, like, mm -hmm. please listen, but don't, rely solely on that like I think it's important to do the work and say hey maybe I don't know enough about xyz maybe I need to like seek out some resources and there are great resources out there now mm -hmm. public yeah. free, free resources mm -hmm. and I think also questioning when those things aren't happening if you are in a detention facility working and all of the faces coming through are mainly black and brown faces something's wrong. Um, you know, we've got disparities there. There's something happening where kids aren't getting what they need and they're showing up there and it tends to be a particular population. So something is wrong there and being willing to say, we need to change. I heard all of you talk about intentionality, individualization, um, cultural humility. You know, we don't know it all. Um, we have to learn. And, and if we're not doing it right, owning up to it, um, because you can't be perfect. And the only way that, that you can learn and, and build those safe, inclusive places is to be open to learning. Um, would you guys add any other suggestions um, for how people can intentionally try to be more equitable in what they do? you know, as a, as a parent for your kids or in your professional life as, as a young person who had I been treated inequitably. Of, um, I think it takes a lot of, of open eyes in the moment because you can't say, oh, I blanketly do this for everyone that works and walks in the door because that's not equitable, but paying attention to the person sitting in front of you or paying attention to the family that's sitting in front of you and move accordingly to what their needs are then yeah. that's being equitable. You know what I mean? Like I, I like when I take my son to appointments and um, I, my, I have my son's permission to lead with my son is autistic. You know, please take your time explaining things to him. You know, start off talking to my son. If he's mm -hmm. not able to understand, he will turn to me and say, mom, what are they talking about? Mom, what are they saying? But acknowledge him, speak to him, have conversations with him, explain to him what's going on. And if he's having trouble, he will let me know. And I will step in to support and let him know what's happening. But mm -hmm. act like he's sitting there, like, because he is, you know? So mm -hmm. to me, just paying attention to who's sitting in front of you and, and responding to them accordingly, I think is so important. Or, you know, paying attention to the family that is presented in front of you and function accordingly. Also, knowing the different um, cultures that you are going to be working with in your work. You know, because everyone knows the areas and the zip codes that they're working with. Nine mm -hmm. times out of 10, you're not going into an area where you don't know 
what the demographic is. Educate yourself, you know, take that time. It may not be on work time, but take that time to learn. Okay, you know, this background respects this, this, and this. This background respects that, that, and that. Okay, LGBTQ community, they respect this, this, and this. So that you are going in and you do have a little bit of education behind you and you do come into that situation so you're a little bit informed and then receiving what the person in front of you is giving you. That way you're not going mm-hmm. in blind, you know, and you're going in respectful. Mm -hmm. which means they'll probably be more likely to receive the information that you want to share with them that could be helpful. And I think that helps build trust. Mm -hmm. True, very true. It's definitely about trust, Adamina. And trust is absolutely earned. And people are always observing how you are treating them or others in this space. Mm -hmm. And individuals do not want to feel vulnerable. Um, yeah. and, and and they've had, for many of them, a, a lifetime of hearing messaging that has been very harmful to them, where they don't believe that they can be themselves because mm-hmm. they don't trust that those around them will care for them or or give them what they need in order to just be themselves. And so Absolutely. building trust is very difficult to do once you've established that you're not trustworthy (laughs) yeah and it's so easy to lose trust like I've lost trust in people that walk into my home within like two minutes like oh I'm not going to say that nope that's not going to work we're going to make sure we don't bring up that incident nope uh uh-uh we're not going to do that oh I can't wait till this person gets out am Mm -hmm. I really getting what I need now because I don't trust you now I'm not going to talk to you Mm -hmm. now now I've shut down very true very true. Okay. Um, so we do have a little bit of time left. Um, I wanted to see if there were, um, and I see a couple of our in-tech folks who have been uh, talking in the chat. I don't know if there are any questions that have come up um, that our discussants today could, could possibly address. And if not, that's okay. Um, I do just want to add in, um, I think that both Jen and Adam made amazing points about like change. And I think it's human nature to resist change, but I think it's really important to explicitly point out that making accommodations to be equitable to others doesn't necessarily mean taking something away from oneself or from one group. Um, You know, a lot of times, especially for, for us narrow spicy folks, for example, we find that um, when, when I have an accommodation that I'm using, I'll find that other people are like, hey, that's a super helpful thing. And then they benefit from it too. So I think mm-hmm. it's natural to be a little resistant and being challenged, but it's also important to recognize like, just because you're shifting or doing something different, it doesn't mean that it's taking anything away. Oh, that's so important. So important. Um, it By addressing inequities, it doesn't mean that you're losing something you know, it, to help someone else, you gain something, you know, to make positive change. At, at, it's good for everybody. So that's, that's so true. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, so it doesn't seem like there are any questions. Um, I, I want to thank um, all of you guys. Um, you've been fantastic in, in discussing that there's, we could spend hours talking about this. Um, and there's so many different layers. It's a very complex thing. In 60 minutes, you can't just go through and fix everything or, or come to a conclusion that, that works. Um, so I really appreciate you sharing your experiences and, and your expertise in, in this area um, based on that. Uh, before we go, for everybody that is involved here, um, let's return to those initial perceptions and thoughts that you had about equity, that word cloud that we talked about. Um, And I want you to consider what you've heard and what you've learned during today's discussion. Um, I want to do another Minty poll. And so the the link is there and Joanne's showing it. Thank you. Um, What are some of the things that you are committed to doing within your role to advance equity and mental health and elsewhere? Within your role, personally, professionally. Um, And as, as people start responding, it'll start rolling across the screen. Here we go checking my form make sure everyone sees their space I like that by the way I also like um 
did you call it gender spicy? No, neuro spicy is what you said, McKenna. Um, I'm using that this evening when I speak with my kid. Neuro spicy. Oh, me too. I, that landed so well with me. Yes. <laughs> in, in complete fairness, I did steal that from the youths I work with, but uh -huh. <laughs> I love well, it. it. It's getting sprinkled <laughs> everywhere, okay? It will, yeah. Please, I'm all about the spice. <laughs> Uh, not making assumptions, continuing to make space for all mentoring, revising survey questions. I've actually gone back and looked at some of the things that I've had that I'm like, wow, I really, I was kind of blind there. Um, I, I'm, I was pushing forward with something that I should have been changing. Uh, provide safety and validation, involve everyone, no judgment. Being non-judgmental, you know, how you live your life isn't necessarily how somebody else does. Uh, fully listening continue to educate myself, incorporate input, uh, open-ended questions to learn more, yes. Um, and definitely push against, we've always done it this way. Giving opportunity, those are all fantastic. Um, I love the commitment to, to moving forward with change. Um, allowing my daughters to explain what they need or want from their education and care team. Yeah, our kids have a voice. Um, and as Yusuf mentioned, um, we have whole groups of, of young people whose voice has been taken away. They have no control over their lives if they're in foster care, if they're in juvenile justice, and they, they should have a voice. It is their life. Listening, evaluate, and improve, be a change maker. Recognizing impacted are the experts of their own experiences. Allow them to have a leadership role. Uh, practice the golden rule, rule, the aloha spirit. Oh, we've got somebody here from, from Hawaii. Um, put my nice. pronouns into my resume cover lover and speak of non-binary adults specifically in conversations that only include um, the binary, men and women. Yes, all of these are fantastic. Thank you everyone for, for contributing to that. I appreciate that. Okay, um, thank you all for, for joining us today. Um, definitely thank you to our discussants. You all are fabulous. Um, we hope that you'll join us next month. I think we're still gonna have one in January, although January is kind of a rough month for everybody getting back from the holidays and whatnot. But right now we're thinking about January. Um, and our next term we're gonna explore is engagement. Um, and have discussants, young adults and parents, um, to talk about that term. In closing, we challenge you to be intentional in using terms that are more supportive and more respectful of the youth and the family experience and expertise. Um, so thank you for being here. And um, remember that words matter. Have a good day. <laughs>